Check, check, check. All right. Have your attention, please. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight and to everybody that's uh, live streaming at home in different countries around the world. Uh, welcome to the Future of Artificial Intelligence Views from History. Um, we're at the Babbage Lecture Theater here at the University of Cambridge. My name is Johnny Penn. I'm Program Development Lead on the History of AI Project at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, who are the hosts of this event. Uh, to give you a brief idea of the format, we have a 45-minute panel discussion with leading thinkers on the history of AI. That will be followed by a chance for audience questions from you here uh, live as well as online. And uh, the, I just want to thank uh, the, the, the PwC for their generous support as this event wouldn't have been possible without them, as well as uh, a round of applause, please, for our administrative team at CFI led by Susan Goins. <laughs> All right, so why am I holding a weird necklace in my hand? I'm going to give you a quick description and then send, send this off. Uh, in the final week of November 1958, 60 years ago this week, uh, a mathematician named John McCarthy arrived in the UK to present new research at the Symposium on the Mechanization of Thought Processes. Um, three years earlier, McCarthy and his colleagues had coined the term artificial intelligence and assembled the field's initial membership. McCarthy's talk programs with common sense helped to establish the field of AI along with papers given by his contemporaries. Now, there are many origin stories for what we call artificial intelligence. This is one, that, one of them. We could, to take it further, trace forward in time from the 1950s to today, identifying milestones that show the provenance ideas that gave way to current trends. This is the history that AI researchers today often tell about their own field. There are other stories that we could tell about the past as well. If we return to the 1958 symposium, and this time turn our eye not to, uh, I've got too many things in my hand here, <laughs> not to the papers given, but to those in attendance, we'll see that a third of those in attendance were academics, but the majority, two-thirds, were from industry and government. Actors whose preferences, be it for profit, efficiency, or control, have since intertwined closely with the field's development by shaping what gets funded and what does not. This story becomes rich and more complicated as the, the closer we look at this history. Other examples of things that we may not have noticed, as a kind of trivial but perhaps important example, is that McCarthy, the man who coined the term AI, showed up uh, in a hyper-Californian clothes with a necklace of big beads, just like this one. Didn't know I was playing assistant. Yeah, you're, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, McCarthy's father was a Marxist union leader. His mom, a Marxist suffragette. And both he and his brothers were active communists during this early point of his life. And I ask, how does knowing this change the way in which we think about the history of this field? This is one of many open questions, such as the woman that owned this necklace herself. Sorry, I might ask your help one more time, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the woman's name was Alice Kate Hartley, uh, uh, whose estate permit me to share this artifact with you tonight. She was a developer of the Lisp programming language, which became the lingua franca of AI research. As in other areas of the history of computing, Alice's contributions have been neglected, such that we're stuck with the mythology about women perhaps not liking computing or not playing important roles in its development. The historian Mary Hicks has showed by analogy that our memory of figures such as Alan Turing has been tinged by knowing notions of heroic gestures. That, that it's believed that women didn't take a part in in the past. For example, when we talk about Bletchley Park and what it, that group accomplished, we think of Alan Turing as an individual and not the thousand women technologists whose labor decrypting code behind him helped him to do what he did. This new History of AI uh, project at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence aims to historicize artificial intelligence and intelligence systems more generally uh, via events like this. And I am thrilled to have a panel of world-class experts here with us tonight. We look forward to adding to this roster in the future by supporting scholarship on the history of race, gender, sexuality, colonialism, indigenous studies, and other areas of research that shed light on how power moves through science and technology. Our hashtag for tonight, all important hashtag, is 60 years from now. One lesson that we can take from the 1958 symposium is the, is the role of audacity in creation. To dream about what is possible and then to create it. AI researchers use the tools, tools of science, mathematics, and logic. We, in, an, in our own way, use our tools uh, as historians to understand and ask questions about the past. The purpose of the event is not to shut down dreams, but to think boldly about the future that we can have. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, the uh, director of the AI Narratives and Justice Program at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, Dr. Sarah Dillon, uh, who will chair this evening's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Sarah and our panelists.
director of the programme and temporary necklace modeller, which was not on my uh, uh, agenda for tonight. Brilliant. So, as Johnny has said, um, this week in 1958, a group of scientists were meeting at the National Physics Laboratory. Am I, is, my not, not, is my mic on now? National Physics Laboratory in Teddington for the first international symposium on artificial intelligence. And gathered in the room were figures who've become key protagonists in the official history of AI. John McCarthy in his fantastic necklace, Marvin Minsky, Oliver Selfridge. Now, some of you may not have heard of these names, but in a mere 60 years, their research and the field it founded has transformed our lives dramatically. You may also never have heard of Teddington, to be fair, um, why would you, unless we have someone in the audience who hails from Teddington. But its other claim to fame is as the site of a famous suffragette arson attack, which burnt out three compartments of the 915 train from London Waterloo in 1913. I wonder if they were doing the kind of work that McCarthy's mum was doing on the other side of the Atlantic. Teddington is therefore no stranger to wrestles with power and to political action. But how about the field that it helped found? What kind of power dynamics have operated around intelligent systems? What does a political history of AI look like? And what does the view from history tell us about our AI future? Joining me this evening are five people who could not be better qualified to answer these questions and more. Maggie Bowden is Research Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of Sussex. Her many books on AI include The Creative Mind, Mind as Machine, and AI, Its Nature and Future, and her work has been translated into 20 languages. Um, Murray Shanahan is Senior Research Scientist at DeepMind and Professor of Cognitive Robotics in the Department of Computing at Imperial College London. His publications span many fields, including AI, robotics, and machine learning. He's also very active in public engagement and was the scientific advisor on the film Ex Machina. Uh, Pamela McCordick is the author of many books. Uh, we've got many books amongst our, our presenters tonight, including Machines Who Think, was, which was the first and still arguably the foremost modern history of AI. And her new memoir, This Could Be Important, My Life and Times with the Artificial Intelligentsia, I like the pun, uh, is published in 2019. Um, Nathan Ensmenger is the chair of the informatics department in the Indiana University School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering and the author of The Computer Boys Take Over. His research focuses on the social and cultural history of software and AI, in particular in relation to questions of gender and identity. And uh, on the end there, last but most definitely not least, is Simon Schaffer, Professor of History and Science here at the University of Cambridge and a world leading expert on the political history of intelligent machines. His study of the provenance and design of Henry Babbage's models of the difference engine will be published next year for the Whipple Museum of the History of Science. Murray, I'm going to um, start with you because I believe you have a personal co connection to Teddington and not another necklace, possibly. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about that connection and why that gathering is such an important milestone in the field? Yeah, certainly. So can you hear me okay? This is, yeah. Um, uh, so um, when Sarah was making her introduction, she said many of you may not have heard of Teddington, uh, but I was in fact uh, born just uh, pretty much a stone's throw <laughs> from, from where the conference was held, uh, from the National Physical Laboratory. So I was born in Hampton, Middlesex, um, a stone's throw from NPL, um, uh, and indeed a stone's throw also from where Alan Turing stayed when he, the house that he lived in, which now has a blue plaque. Um, well, he was working at, uh, at the at National Physical Laboratory. And, um, and in, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Imperial College, uh, I haven't moved very far, as you can gather. Um, when I was an undergraduate at Imperial College a very long time ago, in the, in the late 80s, um, I uh, spent two summer jobs working at, at NPL, um, uh, which, was, which was a lot of fun. And one of the, when I uh, first arrived, uh, you had to sign the, so it was a, at that time it was a completely uh, part of the civil service, it was absolutely a totally government organisation, and you had to sign the Official Secrets Act. So that was the first thing you did when you became an employee, even as a summer student, you signed the Official Secrets Act, which said that you know, if you gave away any of their secrets, they'd be shoved in prison and hanged or something. And, um, and as soon as I'd signed the Official Secrets Act, I was allowed to get a library card and use the library. So I went straight to this little library, which was a sort of hut-like thing, <clears throat> and of course I wanted to look up Turing, and I looked up Turing, <clears throat> and there was this 
photocopied, you know, Xerox manuscript, which was uh, uh, quite a, a fat paper called Intelligent <coughs> Machinery, which uh, I had never seen before. And of course, I knew very well that Turing had worked at NPL, which is one of the reasons I was very proud to go there as a student. Um, and I sat in the library and I read this Xerox thing. I thought that I was discovering something that was, you know, unknown. That it was just tucked in, in, the, in the library in, uh, in NPL. Um, and, it, what, and this paper was unpublished in Turing's lifetime. It was a report he wrote for NPL and was a precursor to the very famous paper he wrote, Computing Machinery and, and Intelligence, which was published in Mind in 1950, I think. Um, uh, and uh, had many of the same ideas in a slightly different version and with, with some variations and some extra things. And I sat there and absorbed this thing, reading it in, uh, in, in, in NPL. So I feel a kind of personal connection with NPL, well, as a former employee. Brilliant. Um, Simon, uh, I don't know if you have a secret personal connection with uh, no. Teddington and NPL, um, but how might um, the Teddington event help us to start thinking about a political history of intelligent machines? Yeah, so one connection, Murray's already begun to talk about it, is just to think about the location of the meeting, why the National Physical Laboratory. Um, so as many of you will know, uh, I guess the National Physical Laboratory was founded in 1900 by the Edwardian state to coordinate the science of standards throughout the British Empire. And that, at least in my view, begins to remind us of something perhaps quite important about the political genealogy of AI, which is its relationship with, obviously, measurement in general and standardized measurement. Particularly, um, John Agar in his very fine book, <coughs> The Government Machine, has taught us a great deal, I think, about the relationship, the organic relationship, between uh, models of artificial intelligence and their realization in intelligent machines and models of administration, regulation, standardization, and government. So, again, Murray's reminiscence about the Official Secrets Act kicks in there brilliantly. There is a very close historic relationship, at least in Anglo-American uh, culture and in others too, between state regulation, the investment that the state makes in programming and regulating not only its own activities but others, and finally, um, a very important relationship or so it seems to me from reading the works of my colleagues here, um, between various forms of standardized measurement and the idea that there can be something like artificial intelligence at all, uh, be precisely because in order for there to be anything like artificial intelligence, or as it was called in the 18th century, I think a much more magnificent term, inanimate reason, um, the idea of inanimate presumably at least partly depends on our capacity as technicians to measure the inputs and outputs of putatively intelligent systems. That is precisely what the mathematics department at NPL was doing from its foundation in 1944. So I think it's, it's easy to, as it were, offer up some anecdotes about the location of that meeting. 60 years ago, and they're fascinating, but there is a structural relationship there which it would be interesting to reflect on and perhaps see if it could be generalized. I've just realized that I could be in trouble, of course, because oh, I'm giving, yeah. now I've started to give away a bit. My experience <laughs> in the library and that about Are you still under that, yeah, under well, that official secrets so, act? Yeah. That's <laughs> what I don't worry, I read it in Berkeley. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, I'm, so, I'm, so I'm safe. I don't think the Turing paper is the only thing Murray read. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it may have been, or it may not have been. I couldn't possibly say. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> um, Pamela, you worked alongside John McCarthy and other key figures. Uh, does the account that Simon's given in terms of the model of intelligence that they were kind of working with, does that ring true for you? Uh, the model of intelligence has changed so interestingly over the last 60 years. Intelligence was 
considered to be an exclusive property of human beings. And so anything that humans did exclusively was what artificial intelligence would try to model. Now, of course, things have changed enormously. And uh, I went to hear Franz de Waal a year or so ago give a talk about primate intelligence. And he said something that just stunned me. He said, you know, we didn't even know what questions to ask about primate intelligence until artificial intelligence came along. Who knew? Um, so now we can talk about cetacean intelligence. We can talk about the intelligence of newts, for all I know, slime molds. They all have intelligence from the cell level up to this thing called the brain and maybe further, maybe the Gaia theory. Uh, this, has this is a huge change from how it was then. And, and has that change impacted how intelligence is understood within kind of AI and machine learning? Do you think that transfers happen? Well, that's a funny question because my, first, my introduction to AI was working on a book called Computers and Thought, which was the first collection of readings in artificial intelligence. And I looked at it recently and it had pattern recognition in there. It had all kinds of things that then split away from mainstream artificial intelligence. I really like sects splitting from the church. I mean, the same kind of moral indignation. And now things are coming back together. So, so I was going to make a comment on that as well. What I was struck by in reading the Teddington papers was what's been lost. So there's a, a language, a recurring language of automation, uh, which is really about work and labor, which disappears, I think, from the kind of mainstream discussions of artificial intelligence, which focus on both the metaphysics of artificial and these kind of cognitive questions about intelligence. But the, the papers are full about automation of various kinds of work, which come to See, be seen as separate from that, but I think are now being reintegrated, right? So if you look at contemporary debates about AI and robotics, it's all about the future of work and what is going to happen to us and our jobs and our children as a result of these things. And, but then there's, there's this period in between in which that political dimension gets kind of excised out of the community and the discussion. I, I'm not sure what to make of it, but I find it very interesting reading those papers, uh, what survives and what does not. But why was it excised? Sorry. I mean, I suspect it's partly the people who uh, move on to places like MIT and Stanford. I think it's in part about their intellectual interests. It's in part about the kind of practices, the specific things that they do and the systems that they develop. But also because I think the implications are unpleasant to a certain degree, right? So if I think about what a computer is in, say, 1950, I would say a computer is quite clearly a job to eliminate the work of human beings. And that's not always been a pleasant conversation for people within computing to have. And we come to see the computer in different ways in the intervening period, but I think we're back to this discussion, which is at its core about work and automation. Maggie, did you want to come yeah. in? Yeah, well, Donald Mickey, who was, he actually worked as a, a young man, he was 18 at Bletchley Park, alongside during the Not in the Same Hut. But he was the first person to establish an AI department in, in Great Britain, up in Edinburgh. And uh, in, the late, in the late 60s, he tried to persuade his mates, who were Newell, Simon, McCarthy, uh, Selfridge, and a couple of other people, uh, to meet at the Villa Serbaloni uh, in Italy, the Rockefeller-owned place, wonderful, wonderful place, to have a seminar about social implications of AI. And I've actually you know, seen the, the actual correspondence that he had between all these people. Well, John McCarthy refused to go. The others went. I mean, it was just about half a dozen of them, eight of them, a very tiny meeting just around a table. But John McCarthy didn't go, and in his letter, um, he said, now, you might argue he was right. He said it's too early. It's too early to talk about the social implications of AI. Well, of course it was too early in terms of actually knowing what would be done and what could be, what would be done. But, I mean, it wasn't too early, I think, you know, to have uh, notions of what the sort of thing you're talking about. And interesting, because, yes, he was a Marxist and, and a communist and so on, but he didn't, wasn't interested in that issue, apparently, or at least he wouldn't... In, he wouldn't actually engage in this meeting, which I've always thought very interesting. 
Maggie, do you, the kind of model of intelligence we've been talking about, does that fit with how you understand what intelligence means within this history? Well, I mean, I said two things. I mean, when, in response to what Pamela said, you know, she's absolutely right, it has changed hugely. In fact, you know, about maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago, perhaps, people were saying AI actually, AI actually stands for artificial insects. And the reason that they said that was that um, so-called situated robotics uh, had started up and had taken huge numbers of ideas uh, from actually from insects and from neuro the neurophysiology of insects, cockroaches and, and so on, people like Randall Beer. So there's that. But the thing that I, one of the things I think so interesting about that meeting, that 1958 meeting, is you've got several absolutely classic, really, really seminal, influential papers there of very different sorts of AI. You know, you've got the go the symbolic AI stuff. You've got Frank Rosenblatt, perception. You've got Oliver Selfridge. Hugely uh, influential and very, very different. And in those days, of course, people were talking to one another. Then you've got a schism. You know, and you've got people thinking, oh, my way is the only way, our way is the only way of doing it, and their way is not the right way of doing it. But it hadn't happened yet. 1958, they were all interested in intelligence, and they were all interested in machine influence, not necessarily digital computers, also analog computers, and early cyberneticians. It was all the same community. And to some extent, I suppose you could say, that's true, still true, but I think there isn't the lack of respect now um, that there was for a number of years. Um, I just think it's a matter of uh, pragmatics. I mean, if you've spent the, all your years in your, in your career looking at um, you know, symbolic logic and um, doing that sort of thing, you haven't been looking at Boltzmann equations and so on, whereas if you've been doing that, completely different, so very different sorts of expertise. I don't know if you'd agree, Murray. Completely, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it's astonishing actually looking at some of those classic papers, particularly the ones that, that, that I find, find particularly remarkable are John McCarthy's and Oliver Selfridge's papers, which really um, describe, uh, you know, they, they predict entire subfields mm. uh, of, of or entire paradigms, actually, not mm. just subfields. Um, and uh, they still seem terribly uh, applicable and, and, uh, to, today. In fact, I, 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 before this um, meeting, I, I took the opportunity to reread Oliver Selfridge's uh, paper about so-called pandemonium architecture that he describes. And it is astonishingly contemporary. Uh, because he basically describes, um, uh, you know, in, in outline, he describes the kind of gradient descent learning that is at the very heart of the contemporary revolution in machine learning that we, um, that, that, that's the reason why this kind of meeting attracts so much attention. And, um, uh, and, and, and he captures it in that, in that little paper. He also describes the, this pandemonium architecture uh, involves um, involves taking your um, so your system and dividing it up to up into little processes or little subsystems that he calls demons. So that's the reason for the name pandemonium. <coughs> and the idea that all of these little demons have their own little task that they're doing, their own little sp specialization, and they're all uh, kind of shouting for attention. And then there's some uh, sort of super demon that decides which one is shouting loudest, which one is therefore ha has the most valuable thing to say. And that whole architecture has been, that style of architecture has been tremendously influential in mm -hmm. cognitive science and in computer science and AI and, and remains so today. Uh, yeah, I could go on at some length about that paper and, and, <laughs> and McCarthy's as well, but maybe we should come back to that one. That, 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 uh, one. Uh, Simon, we've heard about intelligence linked to insects and, and demons. Um, does the kinds of the kind of model of intelligence that that people might have been working with exclude certain types of people? Mm. Um, yes, in two ways. I mean, one way we've already begun to talk about, which is this question of what you might call the strangely absent guilty conscience of certain projects in AI that we mentioned earlier. That's to say, 
if the project is somehow to do with displacement rather than collaboration. If that's the model in any sense, then there are implications, there are obvious implications. They've been much discussed, in fact, it seems to me, in the last quarter of a century around political economy. On the other hand, um, what interests me most, like Murray, going back to read again the, the 1958 proceedings, is indeed the enormous breadth of topics that seem to be appropriate to this theme and the fantastically restricted social model that dominates most of the papers. So there's this very interesting tension inside all of the debates, including the ones on biology, where, say, Richard Gregory spoke magnificently. There, what's being excluded is not just, and this I thought was a very good point, um, animals and primates in, in particular, but um, the principal form of reflection, which was in order for a device to seem intelligent, certain kinds of labor, certain kinds of work, and above all, certain kinds of history, as we might say, have to be bracketed off. They have to be neglected in an extremely consequential way. Which well, is why I think the analogy with Milton's pandemonium is so rich in uh, Selfridge. What, what kinds of labor and history specifically? Well, uh, for example, there's almost no discussion in 1958 whatsoever of uh, industrial automation, which is very, very striking. Automation, precisely, focuses almost exclusively, not entirely, but almost exclusively, on what you might call discretionary, higher order kinds of institutional function. So there's a great deal of discussion of bureaucracy, right? In other words, what you might call the front line of the intelligentsia, the people who've passed the civil service entry exam are under threat. And as Turing predicted, they will surround their work with an immense amount of gibberish in order to defend it against replacement or automation. The bulk of work that was going on in this vast military industrial system on which Teddington relied and which it contributed to is by and large ignored completely in those debates. That's very striking. I don't think it would be so. I mean, clearly, it would not be like that now for reasons that have already been given. The change in the semantics of intelligence is always also a political change, I think. Nathan, you're nodding. You agree? Well, yeah, no, I, I agree. I was also thinking of a more contemporary case. So I've been paying a lot of attention to autonomous vehicles right now. So in the ebb and flow of AI, as AI becomes sexy and popular, uh, or... A I think we're sexy right now, so we'll hold on to that right. for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> kind of lapses into you know, the AI winter and its various depressions. Um, the current moment is, is very much about autonomous vehicles, and so I've been thinking a lot about how do these vehicles actually work? as opposed to how are they represented to work by companies like Tesla. And uh, for companies like Tesla, these are, are, are kind of autonomous devices, AI kind of creating a, a mapping, an ontology of the world that, the, that they're then navigating. But when you look at how those vehicles actually work, it's not at all like that at, at, at all. And so one of the many things that they're dependent on has been almost the kind of complete reconstruction of Mountain View, California to be a, a safe, place for these vehicles to navigate. And that includes highly detailed mapping, uh, far beyond what Google Maps does you know, for all of us, that has to be done by human beings. That's gone. In every account of the time that I drove in an autonomous vehicle, they never mention the person who's sitting next to them with their hand on the button. That stops the vehicle if something goes wrong. They don't talk about the pedestrians. They don't talk about the other drivers. They don't talk about the city managers who kind of made certain laws or changed the nature of certain intersections, right? These are all forms of labor that are absolutely essential to creating the kind of infrastructure of smart cities that we abstract to AI systems. And we talk about the people at Google and Waymo and other places. And so that's the kind of labor that gets lost, I think, when you focus on a, a really particular aspect 
of this larger system of, of automation, mechanization, industrialization. I love mechanization of thought. It's so much better uh, and more meaningful to me than AI. Pamela, I know that um, Grace Hopper was at the Teddington event. Mm -hmm. Do you know, were there many other women there? Where? At the Teddington event. No. Uh, and I certainly wasn't there. I was just this little <laughs> elf uh, <laughs> getting together papers for this set of readings, and many of them were from these proceedings. Uh, very, very significant proceedings, very significant meetings. I should say that 78% of, I, I looked it up, 78% of uh, Teddington staff were women, but they were mm. secretarial. Yeah. So that was uh, there was a huge number of women. Yeah, this was the 50s. Present, right? Huge At Bletchley, number. too, Bletchley yeah. Park. At Bletchley, they were actually doing intellectual work mm. as well as secretarial work. Um, I, don't, I don't know about Teddington, but certainly, I started going to artificial intelligence meetings in the late 60s, early 70s, and it was a magic moment when I had to wait in the ladies' room that there was a line. This has never happened before. I always had it to myself. Um, you, you have personal experience, of course, as working as a, a woman in this field. Well, could I just say... Of course. I mean, I first encountered this sort of thing, though it wasn't, the name wasn't used then, in 1957 here in Cambridge. And um, specifically via a woman called Margaret Masterman, who she's dead now, but she was one of the very, very first people in the world to work on machine translation. And she had, she was the only one who was looking at it from the point of view of not word-to-word -word dictionary translation, but on the basis of a thesaurus, so looking for the context. Uh, and of course, that's exactly what's done. And actually, uh, one of the graduate students at that time, when I was an undergraduate, but I knew her, uh, later on, in the mid-70s, she and one of her then graduate students wrote the paper which is the fundamental basis of all search engines now. So yes, and that, that was a woman also, actually, Karen Scott Jones, so yes, there were I don't know which was at Teddington, but I mean, there oh, were no, a tiny number of I am so glad people. you brought that up, because uh, Masterman has sort of disappeared from... Yeah. And well, there's a, there's a book now, actually, Yorick Wilkes edited a book, came out a few years ago, about her, very glad to see it. But yes, people don't remember her. She's extremely well remembered in the philosophy of science. I'm not sure that the people in the philosophy of science know of her extraordinary contributions in translation because she wrote an absolutely stunning paper at the end of the 1960s on one of the very first conferences on T.S. Kuhn's yes. Structure of Scientific Revolution in which, and there is a resemblance here, there's an obvious connection. She went through Kuhn's text and derived the, I can't remember, 17. 22 <laughs> meanings of the word paradigm that, yes. that Kuhn uses. We always cite Masterman on that. I don't think we associate it, we should, mm. with her work on how machine languages work. That's a very interesting connection between the deconstruction of the term paradigm and that aspect of early AI. I think that's fascinating. Mm. Um, Murray, are the technologies that the kind of worldview behind AI, are the technologies that it's creating worth it? Do the ends justify the means? Oh, what a horrible question. <laughs> <laughs> I was friends with Murray before this. It might not be now. <laughs> Are they worth it? I have no idea. Uh, I, I mean, I wish I knew where we were going in history with uh, this technology. Um, uh, and I, I think it's, it's an enormously powerful technology. I don't know where we're going with it. It's buffeted around by all kinds of political and economic uh, you know, uh, influences, um, and I think, you know, only history can, will tell. Um, uh, and as scientists working in the field, we just have to try to do our best to engage, I think, with, with uh, these larger interdisciplinary discussions, uh, to engage with the ethical issues and try to, you know, do our best to steer things in the right direction when, we, when we're able to. Uh, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to 
help where I can, but... Um, what, what do you, how does it work in terms of your relationship as an, a kind of individual researcher to the kind of structures and systems that are around you and that you're embedded in? Well, so, so, um, so uh, as you pointed out in your introduction, I have a dual affiliation. So I, I uh, have spent my entire life up until a year and a half ago in academia, and now I'm 80% working for DeepMind, who are, of course are owned by Alphabet, who are a parent company of Google. Uh, so I have this kind of dual uh, affiliation. And um, uh, so, the, so I guess the question is very different in, in, in both those cases. Um, so, so, so certainly within academia, then, then it used to be the case that ideally you were driven by intellectual curiosity and, and, and uh, when you were doing uh, AI, you were as much driven by a curiosity about understanding the mind and how the mind worked uh, as you were in building artifacts, and the, and the, but 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 in the spirit of refinement, if I only understand something properly, if I can build it, um, uh, the the thought is that uh, if by building things, then we really understand them. So, um, uh, so that was very much that kind of intellectual curiosity is what drives and drove people in, uh, in, in, in academia. Now, unfortunately, academia has become increasingly corporatized, so it becomes harder and harder and harder as time goes on to pursue your research interests. And, uh, and ironically, I've uh, ended up where uh, I'm able to pursue my research interests, and I'm given complete freedom, in a corporate research lab. So uh, now, of course, because it's a corporate research lab, and like all corporations, um, they're interested in making, making money. But nevertheless, my present position is that I'm, I'm able to pursue research for its own sake in, in this very kind of pure form, uh, you know, in that context. Pamela, I'm going to ask you the same means, mean question. Do you think the, the kind of ends justify the means? Do I think? The ends justify the means. That is <laughs> I'm not going to ask everybody. I'm just picking on uh, you two. You know, you may as well look at the entire history of technology or even pre-technology and say, we should never have given up the cart and the horse. Yeah, and fire was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Look what happened. I know. <laughs> That's your takeaway from tonight. <laughs> fire um, was a bad idea. I... I, I I, I, I do have a clear conscience about this. You talked about a guilty conscience, but I do have a clear conscience in that, oh, there is going to be a very difficult transition, transitional period, when certain kinds of jobs are going to go away. But to solve that problem is a political problem. It's not a technological problem. We need well-educated legislators who understand that and who understand that this can be helped along, uh, whether it's by universal basic income or any... Uh, those of you who have read the new book by Kai-Fu Lee, uh, it's called AI Superpowers, Silicon Valley and China. And what Lee says is, hey, never mind the West and China, we'll get along fine. We're going to have to think about what happens to those people who are shut out of the entire AI revolution itself, like people in Africa, people in Central America. That's where the real problem will come. Nathan, uh, is there anything you might point to within the kind of history of computing that might complicate a, kind, a potentially kind of means yes, and right. utopianism. So it would be difficult to reject the whole premise of the question, right? Cool. Which suggests <laughs> I wanted that, to do that. that <laughs> these Too late. ends are <laughs> one kind of predetermined, right? That there will be ends, that we're not actively choosing to make ends, and that they're kind of outside of human control, right? And that's the kind of fundamental move that uh, technologists often make. Uh, and so, for example, autonomous vehicles, which I don't think are likely to affect my life uh, soon. I don't think driverless cars are likely. I think driverless trucks are. And in the United States, in 39 out of the 50 states, uh, driving a truck is the most prominent job occupation for men. So in 39 of the 50 states, we will see massive unemployment. 
uh, within that sector. And, and maybe there are political solutions for that. But this is not an accident, right? It didn't just happen. It's not a, an accidental consequence of the DARPA grant challenge. This is the product of a set of government, particularly military programs, that begin in the early 1980s. It's now been 45 years of active, massive investment in the set of technologies whose obvious consequence is displacing these workers. And to pretend that this is kind of outside of history and it just happened and now we have to deal with the consequences or solve the problem in other ways, I think um, as a historian I kind of reject that and I want to um, kind of reinsert human agency yeah. uh, in, into the way we talk about these things and not allow us to circumvent that by saying, oh, this is just what the technology, this is the way the technology works and this is what the technology is naturally evolving into. Maggie, what Robert. can we learn about the history of AI by thinking about its relationship with other fields? Because obviously it's not just happening <laughs> in isolation by itself. Well, when it first started, I mean, it was started by people who were um, very much interested in other things. I mean, they were interested in neuroscience, they were interested in biology, they were interested in philosophy, they were interested in psychology. Um, and all of those things were coming together. And again, if you look at that 1958 meeting papers, they're all there. Uh, Rosenblatt, for example, was a neuroscientist and a psychologist, for example. Um, now, I think that's less true now. I mean, there was a period when it became very much less true, and I think most of the people then who were working in AI just weren't interested in these other issues, and a lot of them aren't today. I mean, they're just interested in, you know, starting a, uh, making a startup, which hopefully will make them very, very rich, and they aren't interested in anything else, but there still are some, and thankfully, the Deep Mind group, I would say, is one of the groups but as well as giving this in intellectual freedom to their people, um, they are interested in those issues and they're actually looking. Demis Hassabis, for example, did a PhD after he'd done all this amazing stuff he did. He did a PhD at UCL in neuroscience. And he's actually used ideas about the hippocampus, for example. I mean, really state-of-the-art new ideas about how the hippocampus works in memory um, to design some of his, his latest stuff. Um, so the talk about it is less interdisciplinary because most people are interested in the gizmos and they're interested and, yes, worried and rightly so about some of the social effects of the gizmos and that's entirely right, so they should be and they should be talking about that. Um, but there are fewer people, I think, now who had that sort of really genuinely interdisciplinary approach to the whole field. Who you could argue, well, it's not surprising because nowadays it's so much more complicated if you are actually going to do it, not just read about it and talk about it. That requires such a, you know, intellectual commitment and time and effort that you can't possibly do everything. So I suppose you could make that sort of excuse. But I think in that sense it's got less interesting in a way. So there's other fields that maybe need to be pulled in to understand the history of AIs. Simon, are there other, other histories that need to be pulled in as well? Yes, absolutely there are. I mean, we've, we've started to point to them in our conversation already. Um, there are obviously histories of labor that are required, and I think that what Maggie's just said about interdisciplinarity has to include those kinds of contributions and reflections as well. Similarly, there are presumably histories of the brain and of the intellectual, both as objects of scientific inquiry, sorry, I'll need three hands, um, as objects of scientific inquiry, as objects of therapeutic intervention, and as objects of what you might call social triage. Um, we are talking about uh, something like the mechanization or automation of a series of functions which have, in our culture at least, for a very long time, been used to establish all sorts of social hierarchies, mainly for ill, including racial, gender, national, and class hierarchies. And not to register those very complicated and in some cases obviously very threatening histories seems to me to be, would be, 
a grievous mistake. Um, the final thought under that heading might be something like this, that um, the very idea of the mechanization of thought might depend on certain rejections of historicism. There might be a constitutive fact of the matter about the enterprise of thought mechanization that makes it peculiarly necessary but peculiarly difficult to incorporate historical reflection at all. So in what's just been said about technological determinism, it's just a matter for the politicians, the technologies coming down the track. I don't know if I was alone in seeing a more than metaphorical relationship between the driverless car and that story about technology's history. And that might not be a coincidence. Mm. If you're prepared to do that to Mountain View in order for there to be a driverless car, what does that say about the driverless car model of historical process? Isn't there a Google version of history, in other words? <laughs> Oh, may I just interpret, uh, interpolate here? Uh, when AlphaGo won its Go matches, this apparently lit China on fire for AI because this wasn't chess or anything uninteresting like that. This was one of the, I think, four skills that a Chinese Mandarin had to know, had to know how to do properly, and that the, a machine could do that okay, suddenly AI was a fabulous thing to invest in or to do. Yeah, so I think the, the phrase uh, AI's Sputnik moment has been used right. to, uh, to, 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 to describe this, uh, that, that, that suddenly uh, the Chinese government decided that this really was quite a big deal. And, um, uh, and, uh, and of course, there's been an enormous amount of, of investment from the uh, Chinese right. government since then. They've launched you know, huge... Programs, programs of investment and research in this in, in this area. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. I, this is uh, to anyone, but do, do you think that AI researchers do have a sense of their own history or the right version of their own history? Mostly not. <laughs> is that a problem? I think it's a huge problem. I mean, partly they're reinventing the wheel. You know, they're doing. Uh, and um, yes, and, and they're not, uh, I mean, I think in, in, in general, I don't think it's just uh, computer scientists. I mean, they may be sort of towards the end of the spectrum, but I think, you know, in our society today, certainly with the scientific side of it and the technological side of it and the commercially um, active side of it, you know, history is regarded, I think, as a sort of, Mm, pleasant pursuit for Sunday afternoon if you happen to be interested and why should you be interested? And I think that's very bad because we are our past. The past made us. It's very important. Um, and you lose a lot if you don't realise um, you know, how we got to do the things that we're doing, whether it's the way that we do elections or whether it's the way that we write programmes and the questions that we ask. So... Yes, I mean, I, I think it's a very bad thing. It's very interesting to me that in uh, mathematics, there is a huge way of behaving which says, you had better cite everybody who worked on this problem before and cite their papers and so on and so forth. Not true in AI, hardly true in computer science. And uh, I, I, I put the question. <laughs> I would dispute that. I have to say, <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, uh, as somebody who writes papers all the time, you're constantly being pulled up short for not cite, doing your scholarship appropriately. But I will agree to an extent that I think the horizon only goes back a certain a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. So when so so if there are deeper uh, you know, deeper roots to something, then 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 often the scholarship will stop at a certain point. And so uh, so the so. Yes, half agreeing. Half. <laughs> Good enough. So, so Murray, would you think, for example, that the people who are working in kind of agent-based reasoning would cite someone recent in that they wouldn't cite Selfridge's paper from 1958, right? That they wouldn't 
Yeah, I would. It's the kind of thing I would do. <laughs> right. Um, but, right. Uh, but, but, but that's yes, what you mean by be, horizon, right? That's so what that's I mean by, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and, and sometimes, of course, you can get away with citing, uh, citing a, a history. For example, for example um, Jürgen Schmidhuber has done us a great favor recently by writing this enormous history of, uh, of back propagation and gradient descent learning. So all anybody ever needs to cite anymore is that one paper, which, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is terrific. Well, we don't want to cite one paper, and we don't want to only hear from me asking questions. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to open the conversation to the floor. Uh, we have two roving mics. Please wait till the mic gets to you, because we are recording, and if you speak without it, we won't catch your audio. Once you've asked your question, please hand it back so we can move it on to another speaker and get through as many questions as possible. Uh, so we, have a, we had a hand came up straight away here, and uh, Maria, there's a, a gentleman there. Oh, you've not got a mic. Who's... I've got the mic. Is my lapel mic working now? No, we've got one roaming mic then, uh, which makes things a little slower. Um, so we'll, we'll go up at the back there and then we'll, and then we'll come to here. Um, and uh, do, do catch the eye of somebody if you've got a question, we'll get you lined up. Come closer so I can um, has uh, anything been done over those 45 years to, to catch the truck drivers that'll be out of jobs uh, in, in kind of parallel with the research that will make their jobs go away? Uh, and, and if not, like what, what ought to have been done and what, should, what could we do now uh, if it hasn't right. been done? Right, I would say no. So the, the question was about so if, if uh, kind of autonomous vehicles or autonomous trucking is the kind of end point of a long period of development aimed at accomplishing that goal, have there been parallel social or economic or educational developments aimed at, at, at meeting that challenge? And I would say no, right? And it's, it's a partly the way we deal with the, the relationship with the private and the public, although in the story of autonomous vehicles, as in most of the history of computing, the central role of particularly the United States military is, is really hard to disentangle. Um, so the public-private is more complicated. But no, I, I don't think there's any thought given to that. C can I just make a little clarificatory point about automation? Because I think it, it's, it's easy to kind of conflate artificial intelligence and, and automation. Of course, there are many, many other kinds of automation that have gone out right. throughout history right. since the Industrial Revolution that are absolutely nothing to do with artificial intelligence. And there are plenty of examples of the kind of thing that you were talking about earlier on reshaping Mountain View for the autonomous cars that we can see there's nothing to do with AI either. For example, we're all familiar with uh, the automated checkouts that we get in supermarkets these days, where rather than anybody building, uh, you know, a kind of robot that takes over the process, of, instead you reshape the supermarket with hardware and machines which contain no AI whatsoever. I, I agree entirely. I, what I think is interesting is the way the discourse of artificial intelligence specifically accomplishes some of that distance, right? There is a continuum of mechanization, automation, I'm working on a project right now. We're really interested in when people talk about things as robots or when they talk about them as AI, right? And again, there's a kind of uh, meaningless distinction there. Uh, well, there's, I think there's actually a very important distinction that the media in particular blur constantly. Oh, yes. Um, and, then, and then just to make things worse, then we also have this phrase, a chat bot, which, which is in fact not a robot at all, but... Uh, but, right. an, an, uh, but the point is that these terms are not exact, they're discursive, right? And they're being kind of constantly shaped. And AI and robotics in particular, at least my understanding of the way they're used by the media, not by scientists, is uh, whose work is affected. So if it's blue collar labor, it's robotics. If it's white collar <laughs> labor, it's AI. And that's the kind of way in which people mobilize these two ways of talking about mechanization. We've got a question there, and then we have someone on the... Maria, we've got someone on the end there next waiting. Have you put your hand up? Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how artificial intelligence will uh, or um, operates when uh, interacting with uh, natural or human intelligence. I'm, I'm talking about the kind of stuff that goes on when we're using our phones to search for something on the internet that we cannot remember and 
this kind of outsourcing of our own, own cognitive capacities to these machines, right? Because this is another way in which labor is changing, not only by simply tossing the, the, the function to the machine, but actually sharing it, or I was thinking about Douglas Engelbart and his paper on augmenting human intellect and that, that kind of stuff. Thank you. I think it's worth saying in, in, in response to that, that of course when printing became widely used, uh, mnemonics, these wonderful mnemonics that people used to use and rely on, died out really. I mean, there's just a few cultural historians now who know about them and a few people who are stage memory people. Um, so we can lose the skills that we don't use if we hand them over to um, some other, whether it's a printed book or in this case AI. So that worries me a bit. The other thing, another thing that worries me about this is uh, to interact with these things that we've got today, the systems we've got today, particularly I'm thinking in terms of natural language using systems, for example. We have to change the way that we speak because they can't handle fancy syntax. They can't handle nuance. They can't handle irony. If you want to give, uh, you know, have a conversation uh, with one of these things or even give an order to one of these so-called personal assistants who are sitting on a kitchen table, you have to use a very reduced form of English. And I really worry whether, and I don't think that natural language processing is going to advance far enough, fast enough, uh, for us not to be the case for a very, very long time, a very long time. And I think, you know, if young children are brought up, uh, which in some households they might be, with very much a preponderance of their uh, language use involving um, these sorts of, of AI systems, I, I think that our... Uh, Understanding of language, our use of language, our appreciation of language um, is going to really be damaged, and uh, I, it worries me. We've got someone queued ready for the next question. Just while you're giving thought to your questions, the, I mean, AI is such a, a massive field, and there's so many questions to ask about its social, social and ethical impact, and CFI has many, many projects addressing lots of things. So if, if you've got a question that pertains specifically to, to this focus about history, that would be lovely. Um, go ahead. Yeah, great. So the two bugbears bug bears today of AI would probably be privacy on one hand and explainability on the other. Were those, the, were those issues relevant 50 years ago to the founders, to the pioneers of it? And if so, what were their answers? And if they were to add, would they have added one or two others as bugbears at the time? What would they be? And why aren't we talking about them today? Can I uh, respond ahead. to that? So, so, so that question about explainability, uh, so certainly that was uh, a very uh, important issue for people who worked in the symbolic paradigm of AI, which is where I started and worked for many years, and, and, and uh, which was really inaugurated by John McCarthy, really in that paper in the, in the, in the, in the Teddington Conference. And, one, and, and in these sort of paradigm wars that took place between the different uh, ways of approaching AI, where symbolic AI was one approach and the neural network-based uh, approach was the kind of the, the rival. One of the big selling points of symbolic AI was that it was that you, it, ex, it, it was humanly comprehensible. It was following, you know, reasons that you could it, it, that were expressed in a kind of language-like way and in a logic-like way, whereas. Uh, a neural network was opaque in the way it worked. And that was the kind of argument that people would, would use against the neural network approach. Now, it, just, it turns out today that the neural network approach is so incredibly powerful and successful, if you have enough compute and enough data, that that sort of overrides that consideration quite often. But nevertheless, it's become a very hot topic trying to make neural networks and their workings more transparent for, for, for precisely this kind of reason. It's one indeed reason to try to bring these two approaches back together again. I, I would like to add that Newell and Simon, for example, were uh, cognitive psychologists. They weren't interested in building a killer machine that would prove theorems and logic. They were interested in modeling how 
humans did it. So they, they, got, they got a lot of flack from the logicians who said, we can build a machine that can do it much better than that. And no, that was not the point. The point was, here was something that could model certain kinds of human cognitive behavior, which we'd never had before. So my main question is for Simon about his initial remarks about NPL. But before I do that, I want to tell you a very brief anecdote that relates to what was going on. But very brief. It'll be very brief, okay. yes. So I was in my first semester of teaching in 1980, and I heard the telephone ring up on my third floor walk up. I ran up the stairs, breathlessly got to the phone, and somebody started asking me questions immediately about the history of Turing and von Neumann, which I had just finished writing a dissertation about. I didn't know who it was at the time. And as the conversation became almost two hours long, it was increasingly difficult to ask who it was I was speaking to <laughs> on the phone. Only later, three weeks later, did I learn that it was John McCarthy who was abidingly interested in the history. <laughs> So the question for, um, for you, Simon, has to do with the fact that in the, in the United States, in 1950, the National Bureau of Standards was given the mandate for being the advisor on all matters computing sure. in the United States. It sure. lost this um, mandate two years later because of the famous battery acid scandal. Mm -hmm. But what is it about standards and such that this would be the place in the government that one would point to to, to have these kinds of expertise? It's a great question. Um, I'm tempted to say uh, the association is uh, simply that it's the thought that counts. Um, what I mean by that is that there's something like, you can see this in the history of the NPL, very clearly and to a certain extent in the Bureau of Standards Commission, um, there's something that we might want to call, but we probably don't want to call, cerebral metrology. In other words, the science of standards applied to the outputs of brains. And if one, in, if one took seriously that kind of model, it would massively lengthen the genealogy of this kind of enterprise because it would associate it more firmly and I think historically much more accurately with, for example, uh, practices of insurance, of fiscal rectitude, which we've already talked about, with the invention of IQ at the start of the last century by, first of all, a group of German psychologists and then famously by Terman. Um, it would associate the history of AI, I think, very intriguingly with the history of examination. It seems to me that in all sorts of ways, the history of this kind of enterprise is an episode in a much longer history of the public administration of testing. Um, the significance of Go as one of the four accomplishments of the Mandarin is umbilically connected with the importance of the public examination in, in, in Imperial China. And the production of that kind of literatus, that kind of intellectual class. In this country, the invention of the very term intellectual aristocracy um, coincides precisely with the most important institutionalization of some of the early programs to mechanize thought. They go together. So it's no coincidence, as my comrades used to say, that um, it's standards institutions. It's institutions that are charged with maintaining the external world so that techno science can function there. That's what standardization does. That's what's happening with the driverless car. It's an extension of practical metrology into an environment so that these devices can function there. That's always been the function of metrology. 
So I'm not surprised that it was Teddington or that it was the mathematics de department. What I think might be of more interest for this conversation is what are the implications for the historicism of AI by dwelling on that slightly more, since, as we've already learnt, um, many, not all, but many practitioners of AI uh, in, engage in a mixture of hagiography and amnesia. <laughs> and that was a wonderful anecdote. Thank you. Uh, we have a question keyed up there. Thank you. Um, will AI become a national competition, or is it already a national competition in terms of, as you mentioned, China, Chinese government's in huge a investment in AI? And my second question is, um, if there are going to be another uh, conference in 60 years, what would be, be, what would be the panel discussing? <laughs> Who wants to take that? Well, was, was the question, is it a national conversation? Was that, was that the Competition. Competition. Oh. Maria. Competition. Oh, I see. So, so certainly, oh, historically, yes. that has been true, right? So the mm. close ties between artificial intelligence and, and various much. kinds of military activities. In the late 1970s, there's concerns about Japan. There's the Fifth Generation Project, which is a direct response to the perception that the U.S. is falling behind uh, Japan in terms of AI. Today, we have China. So yes, uh, kind of both economically and militarily, I think these things are kind of closely intertwined, or they are at, at different historical periods, right? So well, these hence are, the term uh, Sputnik moment. That's course, right. Because right. It's, that was alluding to the uh, space race that was initiated that's by right. the American recognition that yeah. the Russians had put the first satellite into space. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I can't answer your second question about what we will do in 10 years when we have a, a, a second version of this conference. 60. But, uh, right. 60 years. Not even can anyone else? <laughs> I will have uploaded my mind to a artificial <laughs> intelligence unit and will uh, robotically dominate the... <laughs> the obvious answer is that on the one hand, it's extremely unlikely that this table will be occupied by human <laughs> beings. And secondly, uh, most of the space just outside this building will be underwater. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll have to get here by a uh, rowboat to listen to a group of robots reminiscing about that long lost moment when the Babbage Lecture Theatre was occupied by wetware. <laughs> <laughs> okay, follow that. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I don't know how to follow that. That's fascinating. Um, I was really uh, struck by your comments earlier about the lessons we need to learn from alternative histories in informing what might happen next. Does the panel consider a form of AI cultural imperialism happening right now where cultural norms are being exported globally? And what lessons could we learn from the way that empires have dominated or determined the outcomes of different geographies and cultures and, and eth ethnic groups around the world? Yeah, great question. <laughs> I sometimes uh, wonder whether uh, you know globalization is the new colonialism. Um, uh, I don't know. I think it's an excellent question that we all should be discussing more. Yeah. Do we have thoughts from any of the other panelists? I, th I think the fact that there aren't is actually one of the reasons why this project's really important. Um, and I know that's one of the things Johnny wants to do is to is to start to precisely do some scholarship that might answer those questions. Yeah. Uh, was was there someone to say to join about in? That, but offline, I think. <laughs> <laughs> why offline? Um, offline. Yes, but why? Why? Well, I'll tell you offline. He signed mm. the Official Secrets Act. <laughs> <laughs> was there someone who wanted to jump in that I missed? Um, say a little more about what's behind the question, because it's so interesting. Uh, I'm, sorry, sorry. You, you need a mic, sorry. I'm from South Asia originally. I was born in Kashmir. My parents moved over from Pakistan in the 1960s and 65. My father came over, very intelligent, but came over as a manual laborer. He lost many jobs, found his vocation as he went through that. He was transformed by automation, by technology. Yeah. Um, but it, his home was really impacted by British Empire. And so, so many of the institutions, the norms, influenced the way that 
India, as it was then, would have developed, and mm -hmm. India influenced the UK. And so I'm really interested in understanding how that dynamic shapes our world around us. But separately to that, I also think that the degree of machine learning based services that we are seeing exported from Silicon Valley, but also we might also see being exported from Beijing or even here in Cambridge, um, what, to what degree are those going to inform the cultural norms of communities in the global south, for example? Yeah, I, two very, do I have time for two very brief thoughts about that? Um, that was <coughs> really, really helpful and in important reflection. One is uh, bearing in mind Murray's extremely important warning not to identify automation with AI too closely. Um, robots are blue collar, AI is white collar. Um, the history of automation in general and automata in particular in this culture is absolutely tied up with the history of Orientalism. It is no coincidence, again, that the representation of the robotic and of the automaton is so frequently in the classical period identified with, sometimes explicitly identified with, Western ideas about the East, specifically about South Asia and East Asia, and then Turkey. Automata appear as Easterners. Easterners, racists argued, wish to make us into robots. They are robots because their culture is so fatalistic. All of those themes for centuries were built into a highly imperialist, highly colonial, highly racialist discourse on what an automaton is. It's why the chess players are Turk. For, for, for example. The second reflection uh, might be that, um, and these colleagues of mine are much more expert to put it mildly than I am on this, is um, we're extraordinarily familiar uh, with the ways in which quite parochial forms of technology and language are represented over and over again as partaking of the universal, and then the failure to implement elsewhere is bizarrely blamed on the failure of that other place completely successfully to emulate the source com community. So the, the political dynamics by which replication failures are explained away is part and parcel of the neo-colonial aspects of what you're pointing our attention towards, I think. Maybe uh, also two quick responses. One is it's kind of obvious that any notion of intelligence is kind of situated culturally and otherwise, uh, historically, and so it brings, it carries with it the baggage of the imaginers. Uh, the other thing, though, I think goes to this point about kind of what is AI and how does AI work and the conflation of terms within AI. A lot of what people talk about as AI is actually a combination of big data and machine learning, which uh, tends to replicate and reinforce existing social structures, right? So, so we see this in the finance industry where uh, big data is seen as something outside of human activity, but it in fact embodies a history of, say, racial segregation in the US, which then becomes embedded in the data, which is learned by the machine, which becomes an AI system that then allocates loans and other resources, right? And, and so the more we move to this model of AI being not kind of symbolic, not rule-based, but being based on uh, some interaction with the world via big data, then I think you're gonna find more and more of that replication of existing social structures and the push outward to other populations. Of course, many people will, uh, will point out that uh, big data and machine learning themselves are, are suppose some, some people will say, are just applied statistics. And I'm right. sure you could read something very sinister right. into that too. We've got time for two more questions, I think, which we have queued. One there and then one there. Um, so I attended a talk by Mr. Fur Silliman, the uh, co-founder of DeepMind, uh, on the impact of AI on healthcare, the Royal Society of Medicine, and he did mention some things on the need for a regulatory body. 
Uh, and you did also mention the need for well-educated legislators when it comes to AI. Uh, my question is, uh, looking at uh, similar scientific well, not similar, but uh, other scientific fields such as genetic engineering and uh, the issues sort of surrounding human genetic engineering. Is, are there similar red lines that should not be crossed when it comes to AI? Maggie? <clears throat> I don't think that uh, AI systems should be used to replace displace human carers for elderly people and lonely people and so forth. So there's a huge amount of work and research and money going into this at the moment, not least in Japan, but certainly not only in Japan. Um, but I, I, I think it's uh, a real affront to human dignity to offer somebody who doesn't have enough human contact, because the people were, they've made, you know, their relatives don't visit, if they have any children, they don't visit. And the people who are working in the homes, of course, don't have time to interact with them. Somebody did a, a, a study a couple of years ago. The average person in 69 nursing homes that they looked at <clears throat> gets two minutes a day of human, human contact if they don't have visitors at all, or don't have any visitors. So people say, well, you know, give them one of these systems, natural language using systems. But the thing is, I mean, I have no problem with it if it's just gonna keep them entertained in different sorts of television. Oh, no problem with that at all. But if it's supposed to offer them emotional comfort, which is what is said by other people who are working here, I, I think A, it's impossible, and B, it's deeply inhumane. And I think there should be a red line there. So on a, a related uh, um, thing, so, so as you might be aware, there are all kinds of uh, attempts to set out principles and guidelines and ethical, uh, uh, ethical guidelines and principles for, for AI coming from all kinds of different directions. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I think you were one of the participants, actually, Maggie. There was an EPSRC, EPSRC um, uh, uh, attempt to do this with Alan Winfield and Joanna Bryce mm -hmm. and other people. And a set of a little set of rules was uh, was was presented there. Uh, and one of those rules I've, I'm particularly attached to, which which basically says that an an AI system should not present itself as human. It should be clear that it is an AI system. So you know when you're uh, interacting with an AI system that that's what it is and you're not deceived into thinking, thinking that, it's, that it's human. And I think that's actually a pretty important um, uh, uh, guideline. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'd call it a red line, cause, but, but yeah, it's a very strong guideline, I would say. And, the, and there are very good reasons for it because it's very, very easy to be tricked into thinking that something is a lot more sophisticated than it really is. And, um, uh, and that it has a lot more intelligence than it really does. And that's one very good reason why you really need to know that, that this thing that you're interacting with is, uh, is a machine and has perhaps certain limitations that you would, uh, unexpected limitations, if, if you don't know that it's a machine. We're going to take one last question. Thank you. So I'm really interested in the role of hype in the history of science and technology. And... Um, Thinking, for example, about Nathan's, Nathan's case of the, the driverless car and some of the other things that have come up today, um, I was wondering if you see that, that hype has played a role in obscuring some of these uh, important other kinds of labors that go into building artificial intelligence or um, some of the problems that might be entailed on it. And if that's the case, is there a responsibility uh, to present um, the capabilities of these technologies in really cautious ways. And if that's the case, is there a, a kind of, you know, how do you balance that responsibility of avoiding hype with this desire to be ahead of the game in terms of what the technology will do and what problems it might generate down the road, right? Like there's a, there's a tension between the responsibility to avoid claiming more and the responsibility of not being left behind in terms of ethical thinking. So I'm curious to know what the panel thinks about that. Yeah. Uh, Pamela, do you want Put to Put your finger on something really important. Uh, the hype is 
that makes my head ache. Yeah, it's and, maddening. <laughs> um, it comes from two, well, at least two places. One of the places it comes from is your editor who says, can you push this further? What will it look like? And you're saying, no, I can't push it further. It won't look like that. No, we are not going to have the singularity. No, we, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other comes from investors who want you, want to part you from your money. Look what we can do. Uh, and so on and so forth. And there are probably other kinds of pressures, too. It's more fun to think of the more fantastical things than it is to say, hey, look, we are so far from that. Mm -hmm. And one of many places that is doing that is a project called AI100 at Stanford University in Palo Alto. Uh, they publish periodic reports it was supposed to be every five years. The first one came out, and then things moved along fast enough so that the next one was uh, three years later, which was last year. Uh, here are experts in the field saying, look, this is not going to happen. That's going to happen. This is not going to happen. This is nonsense. But also saying, why aren't we investing in social issues that this field is generating, which we haven't invested a penny in, like that. Mary. So I feel, yeah, I feel very strongly about this issue, and I find it absolutely infuriating the amount of uh, hype there is uh, uh, around the, uh, the field. And, uh, uh, and I, I mean, I love my friends in the, in the media, but I um, can't help thinking that, that there is this, as you say, it's always the, 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 your editor, there is this strong desire to sensationalize uh, the It's a field. breakthrough. No, it's another and, uh, application. And, 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 and so there is this huge tendency for, for everything to be, to be hyped up. Um, and, uh, so, and I think it's absolutely a responsibility for scientists to do everything they can, whenever they can, to clarify to educate the, 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 the media, to engage with the public, to try and, and, and uh, present accurately, in a more accurate way, you know, what we know how to do now. Actually, I must add a little caveat, though, to that, which is that I don't think we do know really what's going to happen next or what might happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. But we have to recognize, and it, indeed, we, who knows when we might be able to create artificial general intelligence. And I, I really don't think we know. So if they say this isn't going to happen, that's not going to happen, well, I really don't think they know. And it depends upon the timescales in question. But I think that the, the danger is, the, is that people interpret you know, speculation and uncertainty as prediction. And, uh, and, and those are not the same things. And I think it's very important to kind of be clear about what the capabilities are of the systems that we have today and the extent to which when we think about what might happen, there's enormous uncertainty about that. I, I should have added that the horizon is five years. Yeah, not that 100 years, because it's called this, you know, the AI 100, but on that time scale, I think oh, they would all admit no, that we the don't. The reason it's called AI 100 is it has been funded by uh, Eric Horowitz and his wife uh, for 100 years because they think this study is going to go on and on and on and have revisions and more revisions. So It'll be a very interesting historical artifact in a, a hundred years' time. Well, hopefully, um, the more we learn about the history of AI, the more our speculations about the future might be verging on uh, reality. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening, those of you here and those of you who've been joining us online. And uh, can you join me in thanking our panelists this evening? Thank you.